Uh, Dr. Elaine Tierney is our, our next speaker, and many of you know Dr. Tierney. Uh, she is a research scientist at Kennedy Krieger Institute and also an associate professor of psychiatry at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. I think that, as I mentioned in an earlier talk, uh, I'm so grateful for all the scientists, researchers, and medical professionals who have talked to us today and who we'll also get to hear from tomorrow. But I think it's to Elaine Tierney that my wife Kate and I have formed uh, a closest connection because not only is she so smart and knowledgeable about just what our children need, but uh, she shows her own kindness and generosity and commitment to our kids, and I would say to Kate and myself uh, individually over and over again over the years. We have favorite stories that maybe we'll tell you over dinner about uh, Elaine Tierney uh, bussing our food trays after a very late night conversation at the Children's Inn. And uh, another time when uh, one mom was uh, uh, enduring an extensive overnight study of her son, uh, there was the question of what to do with the sibling. And Elaine said, we'll just have a sleepover in my office all night. How's that for commitment from, uh, from a uh, medical professional? So, these are the sort of things that will not appear on uh, a, a typical uh, bio, but uh, really the things that matter the most. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Elaine Tierney. All right, thank you. Okay, and Andy, have a glass of water? I forgot. All right, okay. Oh, I'm supposed to advance things, aren't I? Okay, all right. So I didn't ask how to do it, sorry. How do I? Ah, the one that has the arrow. Okay, all right, so um, uh, my disclosures, because I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about um, my, my research results as well as clinical. So uh, funding support, my first and most important funding has been the, from the Smith Family Opitz um, Foundation. Um, that'd be great, thank you. Um, and that got us started, would, I'll, 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 be, I'll be talking about after the, the, the SLO um, <coughs> component and autism. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about our, our work in, 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 in which we looked for cholesterol, we looked for SLO in autism and found, oh, in this group we looked at, they didn't have autism, but they have really low cholesterol levels, too. So we'll all talk about that a little bit afterwards. And subsequently, we received um, funding from a couple of other agencies. All right, so um, autism spectrum disorder. First, the way I think about autism spectrum disorder is it is not one disorder, it's just a way to describe a constellation of, of, of things that, that occur, um, it, it, difficulties or it, it deficits, you know, it, it decrease in ability in, in, in social interactions, in, in language that, has, that you're using in social function, like interacting with someone. Um, and often there will be um, um, an unusual, uh, an, 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 unusual behaviors. Um, the, the name changes every couple of years. Part of it because it's, it's not a real disorder. It's just a constellation of symptoms. So people sit around and say, we're going to call it this. Maybe we should call it this. One day we'll know all the, all, one day we're going to know all the causes. Um, right now about one, um, one in five um, have a, it seems like an awfully high number. It was one in 20, I'm not sure. So, um, so we, we, we are able to identify um, the, and, and as we're doing more, and doctors are doing more extensive testing, we're able to find the causes. And SLO is one of the causes of, of what we consider to be autism. So if somebody gives you an autism diagnosis, I don't think of it as the child having anything additional um, uh, um, um, other than SLO, it's just people have said, oh yeah, you know, there is some language difficulties here that they can hear, they can understand things better than they can verbally say. Um, or they, their social, you know, they may have great eye contact and look at you but not understand the social ramifications like you don't hit somebody 
when they're playing, they're getting your attention, these kind of more, more, more subtle social things. And we know that autism is on the increase in general, we, and people don't know why. It's, yes, part of it is increase in diagnosis, which is driven by the fact that we can get better um, social services, which is what I'll be talking about, you know, um, better services. Um, but it does seem to be the epidemiologists think that, yeah, maybe there's something, and I wonder about, uh, about uh, an environmental, and also it's, it, it occurs more frequently in, in individuals um, who have, uh, if the parents are older. Okay, so why diagnose um, autism? Um, mo one of the most important things is to, 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 try to, get better, to try to get better services. Um, s s schools um, have, have, have a better understanding of, of autism and, 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 and what kind of programming might be helpful. Um, it can also give you access to services through autism waivers. Um, I, I don't know what all the social workers know and understand all about this. I do want to, um, uh, uh, we'll talk about um, Autism Speaks and some of the things that they, 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 they have a, on, uh, on their website that, that everything I'm going to talk about today, they do in much more detail. Um, I printed out some of the, the, the information, and it's, it's in the, if you didn't get a large envelope, um, then you, yeah, please ask for one. There, there's there's an, enough for, for everyone. Um, and another way is because the professionals can better conceptualize it. You're not going to go into a room um, and the doctor's going to go, what? What's SLO? I remember one person saying they love coming to NIH because I talked to a doctor who actually knows more about SLO than I do. So, so if professionals can can say, oh, okay, oh, oh, it's autism. Okay, I, I, there's, um, I understand that. There's certain medicines that 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 the FDA has approved for the use of irritability associated with autism. If you have a more conservative doctor, who who feels more nervous about a different class of medicines and pediatricians, oh my gosh, they're amazing. I can't imagine being a pediatrician. And you have to know all these areas. So most, as you know, and I've worked with a lot of the pediatricians, most are very happy to have a specialist. You all can reach me. My, my email address is on the foundation website. Um, and almost every doctor I've ever talked to is very happy to do wh whatever I recommend. Um, as long as they know they can call me, I give them my cell phone number, call me anytime, any questions. Um, and I'll go ahead and say, if you're going to see a doctor ahead of time, please call and talk to me ahead of time so you can, I, can, I can talk through what the issues are and have a better, better sense. I won't make recommendations for you, but I can say these are the kinds of things that you can talk to your doctor about and ask about, and the doctor can all be in better shape too when the doctor calls to talk to me. Um, and then networking um, can be... It would be nice. So um, autism pro school programs um, and can have fewer children in the classroom. It, and it, it varies so much from county to county, school to school, country to country. Um, but, uh, um, but in general, some will have, they, they can kind of take a model in it and, and, and build upon that. Um, and I guess it's, 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 some will be a mix of, of, of a various, it, it various different disabilities and disorders in, in classrooms. Um, um, they may have um, social skills training in the school and um, be better equipped for transition programming uh, and maybe have extended school day. It could be autism and not. So what I wanted to, one of the nice things, I, I think what's very helpful, because I only have, sorry, I only have a small amount of time with you, but what's really nice is the, if you go to the Autism Speaks website, just Google Autism Speaks Toolkits, and it'll bring up a page, and there's almost 50 different toolkits. Um, I've printed for you um, uh, five toolkits. They're in three packets. One is, um, uh, one's on very extreme behavior, which we'll go over tomorrow. Um, well, the extreme behavior has some things in, about autism in general. Uh, and there's a packet on, uh, on medication decision making, which I'll discuss tomorrow, and then some, if you're on medications, what kinds of things to look for. And then the uh, um, one, uh, the Parent's Guide to Autism is printed. Um, and, but they have guides on uh, a very nice a sibling guide, a financial planning, guide to I, 
individualized uh, educational program, which in the states is our term for kind of the, the there's a law, the IEP law, that you have to give services. Um, they have a, a nice guide to it. transition planning. So when someone's um, reaching, uh, they're, they're nearing uh, age 18, I think it might be 15 or 16 is the age that one can start. Um, so it will guide you through that because some schools are a lot better at telling you about that and ahead of time and, and, and getting you, you ready for that. There's an, uh, a Spanish, um, uh, a, a Spanish, uh, uh, so what they have is you can get their website, you can talk to the people too, you don't have to do just website, you can call them. And, um, if, and they have in, in Spanish, you can call in Spanish and speak with someone. And they also have a, a, a support group finder. You can go in and put in your, 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 your address, your zip code, I don't know. And they have in other countries as well. Um, and um, to, to, to be able to tell you what, um, what, 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 what support groups are, are, are near you? Okay, so um, some, I'll talk about some, some, st some strategies um, I, I've used. Um, uh, Dr. O'Connor is, is going to be giving a presentation tomorrow, and she's a, 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 a behavioral psychologist, and um, you can reach her. Um, uh, her email address isn't on the website, but if you want to reach her, just email me. I mean, I can send it to her. And we both ask you, please, if we don't respond, email again. I, uh, I, hate, I hate missing emails. I, either I accidentally delete it or I forget to go to back to it because it's not high lit or it's, you know, it's just kind of, so just, just, just contact us again. So um, some of the strategies we'll use, um, and I've learned from her and the other behavioral psychologists, um, and I should say, my, my full-time job now is working on an inpatient unit for children with, I've been doing straight development disabilities for 30 years, and we have an inpatient unit for children with, 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 with severe self-injury uh, and aggression or, or a di disruptive, a disruptive behavior. Um, and um, and we, 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 we have an intensive outpatient. We also have an inpatient unit. We, we do take people from, from, from other states. It's, it's a struggle often getting insurance companies to pay, but, but sometimes we, we, are, you know, we can bring, bring people in. So we do various things. If you're going to be, and a lot of you know these things, um, you can do things such as, uh, if you're going to be going somewhere where, um, where it's very loud, uh, noise canceling headphones, although many individuals won't leave those on, but if you have a headset on um, or you have it hooked up to, uh, to favorite music or they're watching something and they need to be hooked up to the, the, the iPad to watch the movie, then, then maybe they will leave it on and, and that will make it so the, the, the loud noises and, uh, or sudden noises uh, too um, what, what, um, won't be won't be as distressing. Um, deep breathing or blowing on a pinwheel. I learned that I was looking at. They have a they have a nice uh, toolkit on medication. Uh, sorry, a nice toolkit on blood drawing. Uh, and I mentioned doing um, blowing uh, blowing blowing on a pinwheel as a way to you know have to you taking your breath in and breath out if you can find a pinwheel. Um, um, and then if someone can. Um, you, you figured out like what, what what's helpful, um, thinking of something pleasant and laughter. Um, uh, visual schedules, um, the schools are pretty good at that. Um, uh, speech and language pathologists do that a lot. Uh, I guess you've had the lecture, uh, you've had a meeting from, from Polico already, I think. So, so they use the, um, use icons. So they can use that on a communication device, but you can also use it on a board. And the, one of the toolkits has that, um, I'm not sure which one it was, but it, it'll show, I think it was actually the, yeah, um, so I'll, I'll show you, um, I think that's in this lecture. Okay, so um, uh, sometimes if someone is taking a medication and um, if you're, say, taking a medication, particularly if it's a, a little bit sedating um, and you take it at night, if you're gonna be traveling, you can ask the doctor, can we give an extra dose in the morning or can I shift the dose earlier? Um, so you're getting that the side effect to a benefit, um, as a benefit. Um, I use a, 
lorazepam. Um, Lorazepam is one of doctors will be hesitant, and I'll tell you the reason why. It is the medicine that's also used for what we call conscious sedation. You're going for an MRI or something, and if you're giving a conscious sedation dose, then you're supposed to have, be able to insert, you're supposed to have an IV in place and, and, and be able to be ready to intubate if you need to. So that being said, so I usually have the amount, and I have people test it ahead of time. Uh, only if someone, you know, I know the parents done it really well, um, then and, and, and they have a high tolerance, then we'll give it. That being said, we have individuals who have catatonia, autism with catatonia, who are on, they are on so much. They are on like eight, five, eight times conscious sedation dose, but they have an incredible tolerance to it. So, okay. All right, so um, so uh, I mentioned some of the, the strategies that the, the, the toolkit um, will, 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 will uh, has has more information on that, um, and then to help to to help lessen the pain for two reasons: we don't want someone to suffer when they're having pain, but also we don't want them to have felt the pain and give you more difficulty later. So even if you think, oh, it won't bother them, it might be good to go ahead and try to do pain numbing so that they're not going to think and it could be kind of traumatized in, in the future, give you a hard time. So, so we, we, you can use a, um, a cream, like a, 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 a Emla cream, it's an anesthetic cream. Um, um, it, it can be prescription. I think they have um, o, 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 over-the-counter strength as well. Some people use it for sh like shaving or different things, or I guess when you're taking hair off. Um, so you, you can use Emla cream. You can also use a, a refrigerant uh, spray. An Emla cream you put on about an hour before a refrigerant spray you put on. You put very, very soon before. Some of you have used it. I'm not sure if it's just a minute before. If I'm not sure anyone. Is that what it is, Kate? You do just before, right? Yeah, and it's, it's fine to use both in the same spot. Um, um, also, another thing to do is consume a lot of water if you can get the, the individual to, to consume water the night before and, and, and the morning. Doctors first often say fasting. No, it's very rarely fasting. Fasting means no water. It's very rare. If they're doing some endocrine tests, looking at water fluid, yes, but that's um, very, it's, it's not very common. So check with your doctor. Is it all right to have water in the morning? Because you want to plump up those blood vessels as much as possible. Um, and, um, and then using some of the distraction techniques and possibly lorazepam or another medicine that, that you've already used. So here's examples of um, visual support of um, a, a, a social story. A social story is we're going to be doing this. This is what we're going to do. It can be, a, a, a ver you can say it verbally and you can also do it in pictures. And you can create these for all kinds of, it doesn't have to be just for blood draw, it could be your, your, let's say if you have a routine, and I know children necessarily often have difficulty change in routine, it could be today we're gonna do this, we're going here and then here and then here, and then sometimes doing it multiple times, or, or, or saying it, or, or repeating and reminding, they start to get upset, oh, this is what we're doing again today. So in this case, you're going to the car, we're driving, check in, waiting room, Listen to music if that's what you're going to do. Have a certain book. Sometimes we'll save a recommend families if there's a special book or toy, particularly if the child's going to have a number of procedures or doing some that that, that there's something that you save for just those times, uh, so that the more interested, or maybe there's a certain movie or something. Okay, and then walking through. They also have a. Um, Autism Speaks has a nice toolkit on, on, on dental exams, which I think I actually have a picture of some of that stuff in here. Um, so, um, so dental care. So a lot of medications can dry the mouth, and dry. if you have a dry mouth, it can increase. Uh, you don't have as much, meaning you don't have as much uh, saliva uh, production, and that can lead to increase in, in cavities and caries. Um, so... Uh, Autism Speaks has, has, has a very nice guide. Um, they, I read in there, uh, suggest using a, 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 a timer. I don't remember what the timer was about. Oh, a timer if you're brushing the teeth, sorry, not at the visit. Um, so maybe you could do a timer. And, and they had one, a visual schedule, where you have a photograph of what you're doing, but they also had a, a digital frame for how long you're brushing here. I'm not sure. I, 
didn't read it very carefully, uh, carefully, but I think essentially you're doing this, and I guess a certain amount of time, and then you spit or something. I'm not sure. But I thought that was pretty neat. And, and here's a picture, uh, and this they have on their, their website um, in, in, the, in the toolkit um, for ex explaining what you're going to do at a, a, at, at a dental visit. And a lot of children with SLO and other developmental disabilities will need a, um, a, a, an appointment under, on, uh, under sedation if you can find a dentist. Uh, sometimes dental schools, like in Maryland, University of Maryland has a clinic um, for children with, with, with special needs, so, and they'll, 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 they'll do the procedures and, and schedule, um, and Hopkins too will schedule like an uh, operating room time to, to, to do the procedures, uh, including cleaning and, and just cavities. It doesn't have to be more extensive than that. Okay, so this was a really neat um, toolkit. And um, this one is printed for you. It's 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 behind the. It's attached to the, the the packet that says um, uh, um, parents' guide to autism. So um, a safety and wandering prevention checklist uh, on their website. You can download it. It's a, a PDF, so you can handwrite it in or you can type in. I think it's a, a, a typeable form. So. Um, so it gives you some, there's your kind of prevention checklist for safety in the home and community, teaching safety, and then they have individual um, a wandering emergency plans. You can fill in the information and steps you would do. Um, your elopement alert form, um, which I just think is, is brilliant. Um, so you, 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 you can give this to, to so when the, the first responders come, you call 911 or 999 or 119, whatever it is in your, in your country. Um, and um, and, and you, 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 hand it, you, 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 you ha, ha, hand it to the, the first responder with the pertinent information. Um, a, a letter for your, your, your neighbors as well. And, um, and then, um, uh, things for the school to help help them understand and um, to, to work with them to, to see that they are putting these things in place. Um, and then um, so that you build it into your, your, your institutional um, um, educational plan, uh, your plan the, the, with, the, with the, the, the school system for what services they're giving you, they're giving your child. And then a little bit, just information on, on teaching safety FQs. But again, all of this is, is, is um, I just wanted to show it to you once so that you could see it. But it, it's, it's printed for you, and it's on their website. So I'll talk a little bit about um, SLO. You all know SLO very well, so I don't have to go over too much. So we, we did find that about half of individuals uh, with SLO are somewhat on the autism spectrum. By, by our tools that, that we use. Again, it's not a separate diagnosis, but it's kind of trying to make sense of the composite of these symptoms. A lot of it is just, if you look for it, you're going to find it. So lots of individuals with, with, with different development disabilities have these kinds of you know, social, where they don't pick up on social cues as much, maybe have more difficulty with language, usually receptive language. Um, and they can't speak as well, right? So the picture exchange, but, but your kid, right? He can still go in and order a big screen TV on, on right? And one of my patients, and we were talking about the yesterday, one of my patient's parents said, yeah, one day we come home, he ordered a big screen TV. <laughs> it's being delivered. <laughs> yeah. So someone else is sharing, oh yeah, oh, yeah, luckily now we make sure we don't have one click so on, on, on your Amazon account, so. All right, so we found in SLO that at, in autism in general, again, it's lots of different disorders. Um, it, most of them, we, we, we don't yet know the genetic disorders are being found very quickly now that more and more people are doing whole genome sequencing, meaning you go looking at every little bit of, every little bit of the DNA. Um, so in, typically, it's about four times as many uh, males are diagnosed than, than females are diagnosed with autism. It may have something to do with, you know, the, the, the male and female hormones is, is what a lot of people think. In SLO, it's a one-to-one. -one. 
uh, ratio, which kind of makes sense in a way. It's you know we know it's one one um, we know it's a genetic disorder of this at least in this genetic disorder is one to one. I guess there's going to be other gen I don't know in other genetic disorders ratio is four to one for autosomal if it's one to one in uh, autosomal recessive. I hadn't thought of it till this moment. So. Um, uh, so we, about 89% um, of individuals have had some self-injury often. Um, it can be milder, biting right here, right, and right here. Uh, one of the strategies we use for, for biting of, of, on the hands and arms um, in this area is Kevlar, ke uh, uh, Kevlar sleeves and uh, gloves. Um, it's what they make. Um, so it's, uh, I didn't put that, but it's K-E-V-L-A-R, what they make like a uh, bulletproof vest out of, but it's, it's flexible, it's, it's small, it's thin, um, it's just coming up here, it, does, it, does, it doesn't restrict arm movement, but it's enough. We have uh, one, one of my patients um, loves the Orioles, he has Orioles uh, Kevlar sleeves. Um, maybe, I'm not sure, maybe they use them for athletes perhaps to, to, to prevent injury, I, I don't know. Um, um, Self-injury, it, it, it can be quite severe in the individuals, uh, particularly if they have more SLO impairment, sometimes it can be more severe, although it kind of varies a, a lot from person to person. Okay, uh, often uh, severe, uh, severe, uh, severe sl sleep disturbance, I'll talk about uh, medications for sleep tomorrow. Um, including, I'll mention one of the ones we use for, that's used for sleep, trazodone, we don't want to use with um, with SLO if, if we can. We want to go to clonidine because um, trazodone can impair um, the, the enzyme that's already impaired in SLO and increase 7-DHC levels. Um, about half of individuals had a backward arching motion. Um, parents would tell me that they would have their child in their arms and they maybe would want to kick off and just go flying backwards if they weren't careful. Uh, I generally see that that goes away. It tends to be in the smaller young ones. And some individuals, it was just kind of an arching motion. Um, and I remember some people would say they would stretch and had a little, like that, a little flap of the hands briefly. Um, what I've seen in the more mildly affected with SLO is they tend to have a more attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And like in typically developing children, it seems like the males have more overactivity. And, um, and one infamous patient who would, I was with him, and I swear you turn around in the, in the children's center at NIH, and he was on the other side of the building within two seconds. I mean, the fastest boy I've ever seen in my life. He should, like, be in the Olympics. Amazing. I mean, so fast, incredibly. I mean, seriously, really. It must be like, well, yeah, it's incredible. So, um, um, I think it, it, what I see is that that that, that generally, like in, in um, um, typically developing children, I think as they get older, it's not as much of a high activity level, um, or maybe we just have them on medicines by then. So I'm not sure. Um, I also found that hyper sensory hypersensitivity, sensitivity to touch, tens sensitivity to sound and light was even more so than in individuals with autism or Asperger disorder, ADHD, or typically developing. Um, I've had parents tell me the child would pick something up but just drop it right away, and I wondered, was it from sensitivity? Now, the skin does, I mean, the cholesterol needs to get down into those very small vessels, and the children with SL tend to have a you, you get where the hands are, are colder, so not as much blood flow down there. I don't know if, if, if that's why, but it, it, it's common. So we do things, um, the occupational therapists are really good at that, right? And speech and language pathologists are good at kind of doing um, sensory stuff, practicing different things, trying to, to, to desensitize. Okay, so, um, uh, I won't talk really long, but I'll, I'll present her research because I think this is going to be ultimately helpful for SLO. Um, so, so this was a collaboration with, and again, our funding was first from Smith uh, from Smith on the Opitz Foundation, um, and then um, since then we, we've expanded and received other funding 
Uh, so it's a collaboration with Dr. I started with Dr. Uh, Kelly Porter um, Wasif, who's at NIH, Bailey Wilson, and the National Human Genome Research or Institute, because we had a grant that got us some samples, and Dr. Thermos at NIH, and Dr. Ramali's in the he ran the lipids at NIH, and um, Kelly now is the secretary of the foundation of the SLO Foundation. She's also a, a collaborator and co-author. So, so I, you know, it wasn't anything brilliant. I didn't think, oh, autism's gonna have low cholesterol. No, I was like, how many kids with autism have SLO that's undiagnosed, particularly if you have mild SLO? Um, so we didn't detect any in a small sample of 100, any SLO, dysmosterolosis, lithosterolosis, or cytosterolemia, but um, wow, like one, we had like 20% of the children with autism who didn't have SLO had abnormally low cholesterol levels, 20%. So it was like, oh, so we've been, that was like 20 years, oh, 15 years ago. I mean, I'm a little slow in my research because I'm primarily a, a, a clinician, uh, not very organized. So <laughs> it's taken a while and doing funding stuff and all this stuff. So, so, um, yeah, so since then we've expanded it. And I don't think I, what slide do I have next? Yeah, so let me go back, maybe one. Okay, so, well, maybe not. Anyway, so, so is it, uh, yeah, okay. So what we found, so, so since then we, I worked with, with, with Alan Romali at NIH and he ran not just the cholesterol test because the initial test when Dr. Kelly did it in, where when you send samples or, or now it's, it's at Kennedy Krieger, they're doing cholesterol and the precursors, the steps before cholesterol production. They're not looking at HDL cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. There's one uh, group from Hungary who once looked at that a very long time ago. Um, but when we looked at it, we also found that they had really low HDL cholesterol and then these other apolipoproteins, they're called, and they're, there was little proteins that sit on either the HDL cholesterol blob or the LDL cholesterol blob. And after 20 years, I finally learned how to remember which is, which is the good and the bad. I could never remember it because HDL high is that low. So someone said, H is for healthy, L is for lousy. So now I can remember HDL is the healthy cholesterol and LDL is the lousy cholesterol. So, so we found this, and um, so we found that there was not just cholesterol is low, but these other, like where cholesterol is, is, is inside these kind of blobs of, of lipids, and being, which is how, it's how they're transported around the body. And, but we, and there were some people who had abnormally high levels of things, just APOA1 and APOB, these blobs were abnormally high. But cholesterol wasn't high and HDL wasn't high. Um, and well, um, but we also found we also found that because we were able to do look at 7DHC, which is the the SLO gene that is that the SLO uh, that's what's affected in SLO, we could look for the level 7DHC and these other things that are in the the pathway when the body makes it. We know that. Um, they, they, it's not an elevate, so they basically looked at the precursors and none of them were elevated, so it comes down to we don't know what it is. It's not SLO, um, but, it's, it's, but it's low. The, um, be, looking at the ratio, we, 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 we know that it's from higher up in the pathway or something else is affecting the, the metabolism, and because um, because they know that lithosterol levels will change if you have a GI loss, gastrointestinal loss, or you don't eat, eat enough, um, we, 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 we know it's, it's not because of that. It's, there's, 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 something, there's something else going on, and we, we, we don't know what it is. Um, so what we're going to do is, um, so I tested f um, uh, like 651 samples, I, had six, I got these from a blood bank, from a repository from Autism Genetic, Autism Genetic Resource Exchange. And um, since then, people have gone in and done whole genome sequencing uh, work, data, and like s sequenced all of it, and it's just sitting in a repository, it's on a website, I can go in and look at it. So I have a statistical geneticist 
um, and they're specialized in downloading this data and trying to figure out which genes are involved that, that, that have these mutations. And one of the things that we're going to do about that, too, is, uh, well, I'll mention that. Um, Dr. One of the great things, not only we can look at the ones that I have samples on, but as soon as I have approval, I have my Institutional Review Board approval at Hopkins, I can do it. I've been waiting for missing MSSNG, this organization. I've been told I have approval. I don't have the approval letter yet. Once I get that, Dr. Porter can go in and look for all the mutations in DHCR7, and I think they have like 10,000 people now. So he can, we can go in and say how many actually have SLO that are not diagnosed. Yeah, and that would be really helpful for SLO. I mean, it would be helpful for those people, but it's also going to be helpful, in, you know, really say, oh, you know, the, we want to identify them, but hopefully everyone who also diagnosed um, already will, it'll, you know, just get more buzz and more, and more interest in, and, 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 and more help for SLO. So um, we also, when, when, we, when we looked at this, this um, this data, so I looked at blood samples, but they had data that looked at Vineland scores. You might have heard that. It tells you about your, 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 your um, developmental ability. Um, and we, we found that the lower the HDL cholesterol, or the APOA1, which just sits on the HDL cholesterol, the lower those levels were, the more impairment they had in life skills. So we really, when we see something like that, the statistician said this is significant, then you think, oh, maybe there's something biological going on there. And we know if they had, um, there's some individuals who had um, low APOA and B, and those individuals, um, this is just a diagram. We kind of looked at the individuals who had, who had very low levels, like less than fifth percentile and higher. And we know that the individuals who had really low HDL or really low APOA1 had more difficulties in life skills. They didn't have as many life skills. Um, so, so that was helpful. And then when we looked at, and then we looked if you had both A and B low, it was you had impairment. And the reason I mention this, it's a little technical, but when we looked, when I went and looked at the 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 cholesterol levels. So those individuals who had low A and B, which I'm calling HABL, it's my own acronym, I made it up. So um, they had their average cholesterol level was 78. So something's going on there that's really so, I'm hoping we'll know within the next half year, well, it should be five years from now, but uh, yeah. So I did email my, when I sent my statistical geneticist the, the, data, the data file six months ago, she was out for some emergency. Um, I did send again today. I didn't want to pressure her too much. But it didn't get a bounce back message, so that's a good sign. So hopefully she'll be able to, to, to look at. What I did is I, I made a list of the genes that I was most interested in. And they were genes because it turns out there's these, all these kinds of RNA, these things that modulate control whether genes or other genes are read. And there's a list I made that are involved in both uh, cholesterol production and are also known to be involved in autism. And I think those are the ones, those are the ones I suspect the most. So, oh, so here it is. I just mentioned that they had a level of 78. So a lot of you are very savvy to cholesterol levels. Um, and um, interestingly, in, in our individuals, um, even in those individuals, the male to female sex ratio is five to three, so it's like five times more males. So it's kind of like in typical autism, which is interesting, right? Because it's in we're, we're this was in like in one in five of the autism patients who didn't have SLO had had that ratio. So I don't know. Um, maybe it's going to be because lipids are involved in 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 patterning to males versus females. When they're patterned, I don't know. Lots of, lots of things to, to look at. And then, so, so I was then for a while, <coughs> sorry, so cold, the water. Um, I wondered, well, as I was trying to understand what these apolipoproteins were, and you know, I have like no knowledge in this area, but there's these kind of um, uh, diseases that are thought to be extremely rare, one in a million. And when I, we published two years ago, 
we mentioned they were quite rare. But since then, um, actually I was looking at the data yesterday, and um, it's not so rare, because then I went, so well, let me look, so I got this uh, database from the CDC of thousands of typically developing children. They looked at their, their, their these levels. But it, it did turn out our population still had like a 20 to 40 times as many than, than, than expected. <coughs> Sorry. All right, so. Oh, this is one of my action ones, okay. So um, cholesterol is important for brain function. We all know that. Individuals with SLO have ASD often and um, usually have low cholesterol levels. Sometimes they're in the normal range. Um, and that may be because you can inherit lots of different genes that affect cholesterol levels, just like high cholesterol will run in families. So maybe you're gonna have a child who has that gene plus the SLO gene affected. And then we found that, um, that individuals with autism who don't have SLO often have um, um, abnormal lipid levels and an increased rate of what were thought to be rare disorders. Uh, I guess I need to change that as of today. As yesterday, it's not, not so rare, but. Um, so, so then, so we've said a couple of things ba based upon our findings. Um, we made a recommendation in 2007 to in the, main, uh, the main psychiatry journal in the US to, to make a recommendation that you really need to test for SLO in a number of situations. Uh, if an individual has autism spectrum disorder, uh, you should test for SLO if you have any of the following. Low cholesterol level, failure to thrive, or feeding difficulties, growth retardation, low tone, smaller size head, toe webbing, high arch palate, drooping eyelids, um, or you don't have to have any physical symptoms, but if you have some of the characteristic behavioral symptoms we see in SLO, such as the, the biting of the hands here or in the arms, um, the arching, the backwards uh, motion, Dr. Kelly made up that, that name. I guess it means, apistho means arching and kinesis means motion, so he made that up. Um, or a, a severe a sleep disturbance, or if you have a family member, a family history of some member with a developmental disability with an unusual um, f f physical feature. And then we tried to drive home that yes, you can have SLO and have a normal, uh, a normal cholesterol level. And we also said based upon our, our, our paper from, 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 from two years ago, uh, I worked with uh, Dr. Mayeta Snyder in, uh, you know, as a, to, to get her, she's a, 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 a pediatric preventive cardiologist, and, um, and Dr. Romali is a, a lipid pathologist at NIH. And we, I went over kind of trying to understand w w when should people be tested, and we, we, so we, 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 we made a, a statement a little over, like a year and a half ago, we came out with a statement, just a um, kind of just an online statement thingy, um, that we think that all individuals with autism should undergo non-fasting cholesterol and HDL levels. Um, yes, it may pick up low cholesterol, but it also, we consider autism to be a risk factor for high cholesterol, for, for, um, for, for, for heart disease and high cholesterol, not in SLO, uh, but in, in other individuals who don't have SLO. So I think there's a, 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 a benefit that, that for going for, for either way. So in summary, um, yeah, I thought so. It's more like one in 36. I had one in five. I'm not sure why I had that, but. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, right, okay. No, that I guess it is right, sorry. Um, okay, so um, let me read what I've written. Okay, so, so autism is on the increase, and it's about one in, in, every, in 36 people. Um, we know that SLO is a disorder of cholesterol biosynthesis. It's often accompanied by autism-related behaviors. Um, sometimes receiving an autism diagnosis can help in, with, your, with healthcare. Um, 
uh, based upon our findings, there's something else going on with cholesterol synthesis or regulation um, in a lot, in about one in five children with autism spectrum. We, we don't know what it is. And um, we, we made a statement. We think that children, all children with autism should be tested for SLO if they have certain physical features, uh, low cholesterol or uh, behavioral features. Um, and those individuals should also be tested for v vitamin levels and celiac disease, which can cause low cholesterol levels. And um, we think, anyway, so you've already shown you that, and I've talked about the toolkit. And so our future research is our statistical geneticist is going to look at the, the missing data. So, so we can look at that, and then I'll work with Dr. Porter to examine the database and all 10,000 or so uh, individuals to see how many individuals have, have SLO because he knows which of the, which of the variants in the gene are pathologic. All right, and my collaborators, um, Kennedy Krieger, Drs. Kelly Kratz, uh, Bukelis, so phrase, you know, over the past couple of years, and I'm, the statistician was at Hopkins as well, and then Claire is at University of Tennessee now, and Dr. Snyder um, helped me with the, the cardiologist talking about um, helping me to understand. And at NIH, we have uh, Dr. Amali, uh, Dr. Porter, who you know well, and Dr. Wasif, who worked with him, and then Dr. Joan Bailey Wilson, and Audrey Thurm, who's a, a, a psychologist at NIMH and sees some of the individuals who come into to NIH, most know her. Um, I uh, gratefully acknowledge, and it's so important, um, the children with SLO and their families who have been so grateful, uh, so so wonderful, and I've been so grateful for all these years to have the privilege to, to work with you. Um, I'm also grateful to the, the foundation for the funding that started the whole autism and cholesterol story, which I think ultimately will be very important for, for SLO. Um, and um, we've been, we've been uh, uh, funded by, by a few other, I need, I need to update the foundation uh, icon there. Um, and yeah, so I think I've already essentially mentioned all of those and some people, so. I wanted to leave lots of time for questions. Um, so, all right, so we have, we have lots of time. Um, we have almost, um, we have, yeah. Okay. Can I ask you to go back a few slides sure. to where you listed the blood work? I asked to go back to the slide talking about blood work, the recommended blood work. Oh, the, so I don't have any recommended, oh, so you mean for people of autism who don't have cholesterol? I mean, sorry, who don't have SLO? Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. No, I understand. Okay. Here we are. Just happened to be there. That's it. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. So they say non-fasting, and because I actually found out that all the lipids, like cholesterol, HDL, even triglycerides, you don't have to you don't have to fast. You can eat in the morning. So, yeah, I'm not sure about. I think 70 HC. I don't know. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? Yes, hello. Uh, could you go back, uh, go forward to the slides with this protein APOA1? Uh, those, yes. Those are the proteins that are in HDL, yes? Yes. And they are responsible for what? Uh, so we don't know. So, um, so in our study, we just, we just measured the, the, the levels. And, and feel free to email me, and I'll send you the paper. Um, it's also, it's on free access, too. So, um, so I don't know how they measure APOA separate from when it's sitting on top of the glob. I don't know if it's free-floating, because there's a glob of HDL cholesterol. It's a protein that sits in the, on it, and it's a, it's a signal to the cell. Um, if it's HDL, it means it's going to be um, taking it up into the cell wall, I guess, and LDL the opposite. So I don't know if when they do the blood test for APOA, if it's free floating. I tell you, see, I really don't know this stuff. So, <laughs> so, but yeah. So much to learn. I need to find lipid, lipid, more, more, more lipid meetings. 
Hello. We're just wondering, from what age can um, ASD be diagnosed typically? Oh, okay. Good question. Um, okay, so... Um, the, the, the autism diagnostic interview does have um, a toddler module now. Um, I'm not sure what age that begins. Do you know? Two years of age. Yeah, you're right. Two, I think. So the toddler module starts at two. Yeah. 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 So it's called the ADOS, A-D-O-S. And most, most clinics use that because it's faster. It, you can do it in a half hour, you're interacting with the individual. The autism diagnostic interview is a separate interview and you're asking to age four or five. So it's for older and it also takes two or three hours to do. So I like the ADI, I think it's better in a lot of ways because when I looked at data with SLO, I could see that the ADI correlated with IQ and actually I don't think it was IQ. I think Dr. Therms taught me since then is probably adaptive function abilities like the Vineland, but I didn't I, I didn't have that data. Um, uh, but anyway, yes, age two, that's what's important to know. Yeah. Oh, we have an online question. Is it possible to give a skitalopram instead of lorisopam? And if so, what's a normal daily dose? per kilogram and what could be the minimum? Okay, so the um, um, escitalopram, um, it's also known as, uh, also known as Lexapro. So um, yes, that can be given, I'll talk, I can talk about that now and I'll talk a little bit about it tomorrow as well. Um, we sometimes use that for, it's an antidepressant uh, and um, there isn't, that I don't know, there isn't like a milligram per kilogram or milligram per pound uh, uh, dosing. You just start, start low and, and maybe go up. Um, the the, the uh, lorazepam is, um, is, 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 um, is dosing and I believe I have the, the milligram per kilogram in, the, in my other talk. But it's, it comes out if you do it by pound, it's kind of like 0 0.01 milligrams per pound. You can ask me about anything if you want. <laughs> we have the time. Any questions you want? It doesn't have to be about autism. It can be about anything. I have no problem saying I don't know. Another question. Have you heard about Quelbre? Q-E-L-B-R-E-E. -E. Q U. I don't think it's, is it a test? Q U. Yeah, Q E L B R E E. Let me, let me, I can't see it in my head. Can you spell it for me? Sorry. Q E L B R E E. It's also known as Veloxazine. Yeah. Oh, 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 thank you. Okay. Um, um, it, I'll look it up. I'll read about it tonight. <laughs> it might be on my list. It's not one I've used. Um, yeah, okay. I'll have to, I'll, I'll read about it tonight. So I'll, I'll give you info tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. Can I ask how you, how people typically test for people like Robbie with smith Lemley opitz how you test for autism spectrum disorder with nonverbal, uh, more severe kids? Yes, so with, with the, um, and Julia, feel free to, but you'll, you should use the mics because we're, we're recording for, um, we're, 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 we're doing the live to only pick that, and I'll try to remember to repeat questions if I need to. So. Um, with, 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 with the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, they have different modules. They have modules for nonverbal individuals as well as for verbal. So they have, they have four well, ADOS 1 through 4 modules, and now they have a toddler module as well, which will be nonverbal. 
Julia? Yeah. That would be considered the gold standard for autism diagnostics at this point. Um, there previously had been other versions and just questionnaires, but now the ADOS and the ADI are the two ones that is going to be considered the gold standard, and that's what insurance companies are going to accept as criteria for the autism diagnosis. Yeah. Although occasionally some insurance companies will, will accept uh, some um, uh, uh, things that are that parents create, uh, parents complete like uh, a checklist, the, the childhood autism rating scale. Um, it just depends on the insurance company because I know because we, we do those with our, our patients on our inpatient unit. Can I add to that? Now with that, yes. would you recommend certain locations or certain uh, like OHSU is, we're from Eugene, so Portland is the closest, or are there certain qualifications in an autism uh, assessment evaluation that you would suggest? Uh, not that I know of. Um, I'd say probably if you can go to any, in, I think a lot of people can find services in what they call autism centers. I'm. I think that term can perhaps be used by any organization. Julia, any thoughts? Yeah, maybe we'll just keep yeah. Julia. So there are a lot of centers for autism um, and related disorders that have kind of propped up over the years. Um, and so most of those, though, are going to have a one to two year waiting list for an autism diagnosis mm -hmm. right now. Um, I know that's what Kennedy's is, and I know that's the one in California has yeah, a similar one. Right. But if you look up Center for Autism and Related Disorders card, You'll find one in almost every state at this point. Yeah. You ready? Here. All right, just a quick question. Um, where are we at in research and findings when uh, we're pregnant? At have our baby in utero to be tested certain genes if they know that the child's going to have autism. I know a lot of our families that I work with have autism and they're curious about certain genes and which ones are the flag that might be, you know, higher ratios to have a kid with on the spectrum. I don't know enough about that to answer. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I doubt it. Um, yeah. I don't know. Could you talk a little bit about um, if a family contacts you because of uh, increasingly significant behavior problems at home, what is that consultation process like? If someone were to get you on the phone, what are the sort of questions that, that you ask and what are the sort of uh, range of responses that you get from families who you help? Okay, good. So Julia and I will both, we'll, we're going to tag team this one. Um, I'm very grateful that she's here. Um, so, um, so, so I, I consider the intervention, even though I'm a child psychiatrist, I prescribe medications. The first intervention is, is behavioral intervention. I'll say to Maura, um, I'll consider, I usually say to parents to, you know, one consider a uh, medication for one of three's, three reasons. The first being, is the child a danger to himself or others? Are they doing tissue damage? Are they, are they, are they doing cuts? Are they biting themselves, getting infections? Um, or an, another one is, um, are, are they impaired? Are they not able to learn as, as they, they should at school because their behavior is, 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 is disruptive? And when you go through um, and look in the, the pamphlet on, on medications, it's beautiful. The, the decision guide, I'll go over tomorrow on slides too. It's beautiful. Really, really nice to have you, you talk, think through some of those things. Um, um, so, so I ask about safety questions, impairment questions, and, or if the child is suffering or the family's suffering, um, it's really impaired. So, so that being said, then the behavioral psychologists specialize in asking uh, what it, and Julia, let me let you do it. Okay, you can come so, up here. That's okay. I'll, <laughs> I'll do that tomorrow. Okay. Fine. Um, so I'll have to say I probably have about four slides just on the questions I start my assessment process with. So you'll see all of those tomorrow. But um, part of what I'm going to ask is about how long the behaviors have been happening, when did they first develop, when do you see them, when do you not see them, because I'm as interested in knowing when a behavior never occurs as to know what always occurs. Um, because if, if it never occurs in one situation, that tells me some things I can use for treatment, possibly. So 
I have a whole slew of questions I would ask in an assessment, um, but I'm looking at the function of the behavior. What does the child get out of having that behavior? Um, what are they gaining from it? And how can we go about looking at that from a different perspective to say, how do they gain that same thing, but using appropriate skills? And then we're gonna look at how do we teach those kind of skills. So it's a long process, and that's probably part of, a big part of what I'll talk about tomorrow, is the process for assessment of a behavior problem to develop the treatment that works, it takes a lot of time, and you gotta be patient. Yeah, it's very painful. And the um, uh, proloquo, or using uh, picture boards, it doesn't need to be in electronic form, and a lot of children uh, would do better with picture exchange, and also you can, it's portable, and they don't break as easily. Yeah, yeah the low-tech option is really nice, yeah. because when you don't have power, and you can't charge that phone, or they've broken the tablet for the fifth time, or you're on a plane and you can't get internet access, it's great to have some pictures instead, <laughs> or signs. So I'm all about more total communication than finding one modality only. Great, thank you. Uh, two, two additional requests. First, um, there's a lady that's chatting that wants to know who the lady from Texas is so they can give her numbers. Who's from Texas besides me in here? Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you the uh, Annette's number so you can, she wants to, to talk to you. Uh, so, uh, next question is, do you find that a combination of drugs work better in behavior or a single line medication? Um, it depends on the situation. I try to do single line if I can. Um, and I also choose, when I choose medicines, I weigh it with the family depending upon the, the side effects of the medications. For example, our antipsychotics work for every single psychiatric disorder we have, including ADHD, but it's not my go-to medicine because of the side effects. If it had no side effects, everybody could get it. But because it does, it's my last line of medication. I try to use um, the medicines that have fewer side effects, like maybe clonidine, guanfacine, those are ones that pediatricians are very comfortable with those as well, which is important because they're often the ones um, uh, prescribing. Um, they also have um, sometimes the side effects of medicines. I mean, they're part of the therapeutic effect. We call them side effects, but they're beneficial. If you want calming or sedation, if you want to sleep, great. Um, and even though the medicines like clonidine and guanfacine, which I'll talk about tomorrow as well, um, work for, they're like it's, they're, Guanfacine, the, the extended release is called Intuniv, and that's marketed, FDA approved for ADHD treatment. It also, since it's a medicine that treats high blood pressure, it helps prevent the heart rate from going high. So people, like a lot of people have panic disorder, the heart rate is, speed, is speeding up, and if you can slow, prevent that from happening, they're not as anxious. So it, it tends to help anxiety, um, it helps um, mellow people out, people out a little bit more. So I try to, when I choose medicines too, I'm often trying to think about what might be, we might consider side effect is also a beneficial effect. So it's not an adverse effect, it's just a side effect, it's a, a beneficial effect. So I do try to, if I can, do one medicine and the ones that have the least uh, potential side effect. Um, the other thing I do um, is that I try to, as a psychiatrist, I find it helpful so sometimes if I can try to figure out if there's a constellation, just like we do with autism, you're kind of trying to figure out there's a constellation here. There's some social stuff, some maybe some unusual behaviors or repetitive behaviors, but maybe not. You don't even need the repetitive behaviors anymore for the diagnosis or, or the change again. It's just going to change in two years. So, so it, and um, that's why I just say ASD autism. It doesn't matter. It's all artificial. So, um, so you. So the same thing is I try to look at, is there overactivity and difficulty focusing? Is this kind of ADHD picture? Because it helps guide me, in maybe in kind of guiding me in what medications to, to use. It's not very precise, but that's, that's what we do in, in autism um, work, as well as in individuals with SLO, or somebody has a lot of re, re, um, um, stereo, uh, uh, compulsive behaviors where they have to do things in a certain way or change in routines. We try to treat that behaviorally, like our first line for OCD would be behavioral. Um, you know, maybe by trying to mix things up so they don't get into a pattern, and Julia can talk about techniques for that, and then I might do, if it's severe enough, try an antidepressant. And sometimes when I choose medicines, it's also knowing uh, what potential, like antidepressants, I'm very cautious. I ask 
is there a family history of manic depression, also known as bipolar disorder? Because if there is, there's a higher chance of maybe actually inducing if someone biologically has a predisposition for bipolar disorder and you give an antidepressant, it can make it come out, make things a lot worse. So you know, there's kind of those kind of considerations. But I'd say out of all the meds I use, probably clonidine and guanfacine are the ones that you can get the best response for sleep and calming. And um, yeah. Uh, there was a comment online about um, calming uh, their, their son, um, and we've actually experienced this ourselves too, but she, uh, she said, we have positive experience with a weighted blanket to, to uh, reach our son to a relaxed way, and, and I know Ashton and, and my other kids have experienced that as well too. That's great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Yes, doing, th that's the kind of thing, um, looking at to see what they've done for individuals who have autism spectrum disorder, um, because some of those things are going to work as well, and a, a, a weighted blanket is something somehow calming. I, I'm glad you mentioned that, or the person mentioned that, and you too. I'm seeing no more questions. I think that it's just about time for our group picture. But first, let's give a big round of applause to Dr. Elaine Tierney. Thank you. Hey, Andy. It. I'm glad that we'll get to hear from her again tomorrow. Do you have one more? Yeah, there's one more question oh, that just sorry. popped up. We got Go a ahead. second. Um, it says, blood tests, dental checks, ear checks are difficult. Um, Lorzepam, does it affect breathing? Is it risky? Is it, necessary, is it necessary to be in a hospital when taken, and how much in advance should it be given? Um, so uh, I think tomorrow, too, I, I have, um, it has, right, okay. So you give it about a, an hour before. Um, it, it peaks. Um, it doesn't have to be in a hospital if you're on a lower dose. It's going to, uh, your doctor has to be comfortable prescribing. But you can often, if you're going into, if you're able to go into a, a, a some dentist will use, uh, their, their own anesthetic, some dentists, you, you can get ones who do that, then you wouldn't want to take it before you're going in. Um, or if you're going for dental procedure in, um, in a hospital or a clinic, depending upon. But in those cases, you, ha you have an anesthesiologist or an uh, anesthetist, somebody who specializes in, in that, that is actually going to administer it on site with something that works faster. Excellent, and uh, I'll remind everyone that tomorrow at 1.30, Dr. Tierney will be talking to us about extreme SLOS behaviors and medications. And Dr. O'Connor is right, right before or after me as well. That's right, and then Dr. O'Connor, uh, right after you at 2.15, challenging behaviors and triggers non-medication treatment approaches. So uh, I think that'll be helpful to all of us. Great, thank, thank you, you so much.